Friends, we have gathered here today to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life, legacy, and love of Robert Homer Simpson. We come together as family and friends acknowledging our human loss and finding strength and comfort in God and each other. We are grateful for the beautiful music that Stanley, our Director of Music Ministries, provided. You will know that we will not be singing hymns. That is intentional. And at the end of the service, we will hear more music. I invite you to incline your heart to this word from the Holy Scripture. The Gospel according to John, 14th chapter, the first and the fourth verses. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. Family, today is a similar time that we spent a few weeks ago when we would join together for the graveside. It was cold, it was icy, it was snow covered ground. Peggy, that's where I took a knee. We give thanks for the warmth of this place a place that Bob loved deeply for so, so many years. I came to know Bob a few years ago. I told Peggy this, uh, Lynn, immediately I fell in love with him, immediately. We talked and we smiled, and of course I had no idea of the breadth and depth, uh, the breadth and experience related to uh, weather, his hurricane work the significant accomplishments that he made throughout his lifetime. He was, as his autobiography is titled in part, a hurricane pioneer. In a few moments, friends and family will share their rich and fulfilling experiences about Dr. Simpson. I want to draw your attention to the gospel lesson from John for just a, a few moments. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus, Jesus is issuing a word of encouragement to his beloved disciples, a word for them to harbor in their hearts. Be encouraged, keep your trust, keep your confidence in God. And then these words, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Friends, this is another word of encouragement, of assurance that Jesus does not leave us or forsake us. In fact, there is plenty of room in the kingdom of God. This is the place for eternal Dr. Simpson lived a full and rich life. He was blessed to live 102 years. What a gift. He lived his life in God. And Jesus has come and taken his beloved disciple unto himself and has prepared a place for him in eternal glory. I was fascinated and I marveled at all of the articles and blogs that have been written and posted on the internet. Uh, Lynn, thank you for sending those links to me. Just fascinated beyond belief of the accomplishments of this great disciple of Jesus. Friends, there will come a time 
when you and I will come face to face with our own mortality. I pray that as we live our lives in God, we too will have the confidence and assurance that Brother Bob had, that living as a disciple of Jesus, that just like for Bob, Jesus will come and prepare a place for you and for me. Thanks be to God. Amen. We invite family and friends to come and to share. They will come to the lecture here. We will begin with Peggy, Bob's daughter, one of Bob's daughters. And then we will hear other witnesses from family and friends. Peggy, would you come? Well, you know, it wouldn't be a good day if it weren't a weather day. Since my dad, after all, you know, what do you expect? I'm going to tell you some things that I don't know whether you know about him or not, but sort of the lived life that Lynn and I had with him, and that he, he had lots of nieces and nephews that he took care of all the time, even when they weren't scientists. But uh, several years ago, one of the things that really stands out for me was that several years ago, the American Meteorological Society uh, persuaded my dad to talk at its Florida convention on how he and engineer Herb Safford had developed this uh, Safford Simpson hurricane wind scale. How they developed it, why did it work, how did it work. So he was the get out the uh, crowd speaker, 8 a.m. on the opening day. First thing that happened was the sound system malfunctioned. That meant that Greg Holland had to kneel next to my dad with a live mic for a half an hour. <laughs> um, my dad did right well, though. He was 100 at the time, and uh, it, was, it was even more amazing because his eyes were crossing and malfunctioning, and he really couldn't see the text of the speech he worked so hard on. But he was really surprised when he got a standing ovation, and then he was really pleased when so many people came up afterwards to talk to him. For him, however, the highlight of that weekend was late that night when Max Mayfield brought a half dozen young hurricane forecasters upstairs to talk with him over dessert for more than an hour. Now, that afternoon, my dad, my Max had asked me if it was okay to bring over some of these young forecasters. They were too embarrassed to come up and introduce themselves, but they really wanted to meet him. And I said, of course he wants to meet him. And so there was this awkward, you know, meet and greet and a photo shot, you know, so the not selfies, they were all photos of all the forecasters together. But nevertheless, uh, they sort of then wandered off. And I said to Max, if they really want to talk to him, you know, they, he would love to talk to them, but that'd have to be later tonight after dinner with Greg and in a quiet space so he can hear. And Max said, we can make that happen. And they did. And so late that night, these half dozen young forecasters, the ones working on today's hurricanes, came up and for more than an hour, Lynn and Greg and I were relegated to another table. And for more than an hour, it was just the forecasters there, old one generation to another talking. And for my dad, that was you know, so much more important than a standing ovation, really. Uh, I didn't live too, through too many hurricanes with my dad. Uh, Lynn, I was nine and Lynn was five when my parents were divorced, but you know, we both paid attention. And I was especially uh, paying attention one time when a bunch of uh, the leaders of the National Organization for Women in Florida did a sit-in at my dad's hurricane office. And they were protesting the facts that hurricanes were named after women and that led all these newspapers to do all these lurid headlines about women raging, you know, et cetera. And they said, this is, you know, and my dad, uh, you know, I'd been a true blue feminist. Joanne had lived through a generation, you know, her lifetime of sexism. We all knew what these people were trying to do. So my dad didn't kick them out until they had gotten some publicity about being there. And then he said, now, you know, this is really too weighty of a subject for me to tackle. But here's where you go to in the Department of Commerce, the people who actually do name the hurricanes. And so they did that. 
policy changed, and today hurricanes are named after both men and women. Uh, my dad was an optimist growing up in the Depression, or maybe because of growing up in the Depression. So when his physics degree didn't lead to a job, he went back to the music. He had led his, uh, he had worked his way through college at Southwestern University uh, leading the band. And uh, he had also directed choir. So he went in search of a job, and he found that all these uh, little high schools in tiny towns across Texas really wanted a band director. They could care less about anybody teaching physics. Sorry, you all. <laughs> but uh, he did several of those before he found a real job in, the, in science and the Weather Bureau. When he, decades, decades later, when he was deep into writing his memoirs, my dad suddenly began talking about how he was a loner. I was just astounded and I really disagreed. I mean, he was a, a social animal as far as I'm concerned. But his early solo life may have really equipped him to be an explorer, his life in exploration. Not a loner, but an explorer. And he got the idea for this memoir so that he could pass on the ways that he had made decisions throughout his life. Not a straight line. He uh, really brought a lot of different kinds of people, many of them having nothing to do with weather, together to, for a common goal of making something happen. One example was when he was head of the Pacific Weather um, Service and the governor of Hawaii was eager to work with him to build a road up to Mauna Loa. The governor had the use of prison labor, free. Now, he had no interest really in weather. He wanted to build a ski resort. And my dad was pretty sure that the Weather Bureau would not uh, think kindly about a ski resort, but he said, you know, in thinking about it, that the road could probably help pave the way, literally, to establishing an upper atmospheric measuring station up on Mauna Loa, the highest place in the world that gets sun year round. And so that's eventually what happened. This, the governor never got his ski resort, however. Uh, a couple of, uh, last week, former hurricane forecaster Neil Frank wrote me and said, you know, I'm so sorry I can't be there, but, you know, your dad was a rare visionary. He saw things that could happen in weather and diagnosing weather and making, you know, helping us uh, understand it and deal with it. But he made his visions become reality. That's very, very rare. And among the things he said, just you know, one paragraph about, you know, he helped create the Tornado Research and Forecast Center, helped create the National Hurricane Research Project, helped create and reorganize the National Hurricane Center, and a lot more. And he said, my dad's aggressive investigation of severe weather has really made this country a lot safer. I didn't ever think of it that way, but that's good to know. Um, now, originally, this memoir, was just going to be for family and friends. Uh, that didn't mean that he and Joanne didn't sweat getting the details right. There were a lot of things that they thought this way, and it turned out it was that way. And one of the most painful was that he was pretty sure he was the first person to uh, fly into a hurricane. Many, many, many months later, and many, many, many documents, he found out, nope, he wasn't. <laughs> now, when he wrote this memoir, he self-published it at Kinko's. He really didn't have a grand plan for what to do with it. Uh, but one thing, so he passed it out to relatives, passed it out to a few people who wanted to see it, you know, friends working with Joanne. Well, then Tao read it. And Tao said, you, wait a minute, there's a lot of science in here. It's not just family stories. There's a lot of science in here, and scientists ought to be able to read it. And so you ought to maybe start a blog. Or, you know, get somebody to, to help you expand it and stuff in all the science. And, you know, that's, you, sh you can't just let this go away. There's a lot of stuff people would like to read and learn from. But nobody, my dad asked around and other people asked around, but nobody seemed really interested. So he dropped it. A couple years later, Neil Dorse, the historian at NOAA, uh, got in touch again. He'd finished the project he'd been on, and he said, are you still interested in expanding that to memoir? And my dad said, well, why not? Yep, yeah, absolutely, let's do it. So that opened years of research, of uh, working with Neil Doris. He read all the oral histories, he read all the papers, and he interviewed him a lot more. And then what has happened as a result of that collaboration is this book that the AMS is publishing and will 
keep saying, be out soon. And it's called um, Bob Simpson, Hurricane Pioneer. Now in the past five years, Lynn and I got to know our dad on an entirely different level as he made a life on his own without Joanne. He told us later he really hadn't expected to live long after she died, but we didn't know that. Um, we, Lynn and I talked to him straight about major and minor decisions. Who did he want to invite to Cosmos Club next week? Did he want to renew his opera tickets? On that latter one, Lynn remembers he didn't miss a beat. He said, absolutely, we've got to grab those tickets quick because those are the down front seats. We've got to get those. You've got to order right now. So she did. He also loved the new technology, almost all new technology. Barbara Schober was his um, techno guru, and so he, she would help him navigate through a new iPad. And then there was a new iPhone, and then there was a new iPad, and then there was a Kinko's, and then there was a Kinko's on the iPad. And that way he could not only read books that he could, you know, get up to 20 point time, but he could receive his email. And every time Lynn and I would go over there, we'd look through all the email that came in, we'd get rid of all the Viagra stuff. <laughs> we would find the real messages from real people, and I, we would read it to him, and then he would dictate the answer. He always dictated the answer. So he uh, remained passionate about football, and about politics, and about his nieces and nephews, and about his brother down in Tuscaloosa, his younger brother, and you know about all kinds of other people who just passed his way. He didn't have scientists around as often as he would have liked. I know that. Any time Greg came near, he was body snatched. And Rick Anthes too, which will lead to. So you know, he when people were around, you know, he was thrilled to um, have lunch with them or just talk. But he never just sat there. He got very curious in the last two years, three years of his life, about his caregivers. And he started asking them questions, you know, about their life in their home countries of Ghana, Sierra Leone, and Tanzania. How was life there? How are they doing here? How are their kids doing here? And he really wanted to know. Now, one of the startling things that happened in the last four or five months was he decided to teach them to sing Texas songs. <laughs> My dad was always a musician, remember? And so it was a great surprise to some guests last fall uh, when the caregivers, uh, after a sort of a casual uh, dinner, the caregivers came out and serenaded them with the eyes of Texas are upon you, <laughs> as well as deep in the heart of Texas and Sarah Ward. He was so proud of them. So, <laughs> so he was in charge. Even when he was more and more dependent physically, he kept his dignity and he kept his sense of worth, and he was really fully engaged until the end. And he never stopped asking how we were, how we're going to be, and to tell us to be sure to take care of ourselves. on the steering committee with 
with whom it is impossible to communicate. Well, Harley gave me a stare. <laughs> and he said, we've done you an enormous favor. That man is one of the most extraordinary human beings you will ever have the opportunity to know. You just go figure it out. <laughs> well, I have great respect for Harley, and I got that lesson. I have to say that now, I don't think that Bob then was all that ancient. <laughs> and never again, when I was around, did his hearing aid. So at the next dinner meeting, I was in charge of the seating. So I put Bob and Joanne at my table, Bob next to me. And from that time onward, he and I were best of friends. That day, he told me his oft-told story about the Corpus Christi hurricane of 1919 and how his family got out of their house through the rising water to safety. In that story, everybody involved was a hero but Bob. Well, he was only six years old, but his job was to hold on to the remains of fried chicken from the table, which was wrapped up in the tablecloth, and while his father carried him on his shoulders through the flood. Bob was a failure. He dropped the bundle in the water, and he cried as it was swept away in the current. And looking back after all this time, I realized Bob was never the star any of the stories I ever heard him tell. My initial experiences with him were explore, Explorers Club related. According to the records, he became a fellow of the club in 1979. To this day, I still know nothing about his involvement with Explorers prior to the day I met him. I was immediately impressed with how seriously he took the responsibilities and assorted tasks he was given, none of them glamorous. He quietly made things happen, and he was extremely effective in helping guide the group to make wise decisions. And everybody respected him. I never heard Bob then or anywhere else, there at Explorers or anywhere else, ever bring up his own contributions to anything. He was a perfect example of my belief that people who really do things that are truly important usually keep their mouths shut and just quietly carry on, while those who call the most attention to themselves and indulge in self-promotion tend to be the ones who inflate their own accomplishments and occasionally even invent some of them. Very soon I began to be treated as family members. I was invited to occasions where either Bob or Joanne was being honored. Uh, anniversary and birthday parties, holiday dinners, to meet assorted friends of theirs that wanted me to get to know, and to meet various family members who came to town. That's how I came to encounter many of you, and even acquire a few friends of my own in the lot. Bob was extremely proud of Joanne and of his two daughters, and he spoke to me often of their achievements. But he also told me about many of you, family members, friends, professional associates, and what makes you special. I found him to be extraordinarily generous, kind, and genuinely interested in other people. It was how Bob handled the last five years of his life after Joanne died that impressed me the most. He had already been noticeably weakening physically, and from that moment on, he required uh, caretakers around the clock. He was fortunate to have such wonderful ones. He refused to allow his failing body to force him to give up on anything he wanted to do, just become, because it had become hard, extraordinarily difficult, or even when it was next to impossible. As Peg said, he considered con continued his season subscriptions to the opera, concerts, to the theater, and he attended any additional cultural events that interested him, often going out several nights a week. He went to restaurants, he went to people's homes, he went wherever he was invited, 
provided you didn't have to go up more than a step or two. Peg installed a ramp to her back door, and her house became the venue for parties and many special dinners. As long as Bob could manage to get himself into the passenger seat of her car, wind roving everywhere. But after that, he hired transportation that could take him in his wheelchair. He kept going. He wouldn't sit back and let others do for him as long as he could possibly do for himself. For far too long, Bob used a cane when it would have been much safer to use a walker. A walker when he should have been in a wheelchair. And when he did agree to use a wheelchair, he insisted on sitting in a regular chair when he got to his destination, whether it was across town or across the room. I often couldn't watch. I was certain he was going to fall, which he did on occasion. And though he did hurt himself, sometimes badly, it was never the total disaster that it might have been. When he finally stayed in the wheelchair, I realized the end was close. Almost every Sunday for the last five years of his life, Bob hosted his daughters and assorted friends to brunch at the Cosmos Club. I was the beneficiary of this countless times. There, we would discuss world affairs, <coughs> politics, books, the meaning of life, whatever Bob had been thinking about the previous week. He paid attention to everything, and he was a very thoughtful and philosophical person. He did show frustration occasionally, mostly with his failing eyesight. It was a monumental crisis when he no longer could see well enough to read a book until we introduced him to the candle. And by using the largest font, Bob was back in business again. I suggested that it truly wasn't necessary to order 14 books for his candle at one time. I, I explained that they would download instantly, and I thought it would be more prudent just to order one or two. Bob would have no part of that. And I soon realized that he was reading five or six books a, minute, a week at a minimum. He was always cheerful. I never saw him angry ever. He was appreciative of everything, and he didn't complain. In addition to these encounters, he telephoned me a lot. He would call to make sure I was OK, but it often turned out he was concerned about his daughters or someone important to him. And he wanted to talk over how he might fix whatever he perceived to be the problem. He just wanted to make everything right for everybody else. He didn't fret over his own difficulties. He bore it all with grace and with humor. A handful of us were with him at his apartment to celebrate his 107th birthday just before he died. Although he had been very weak in the days prior to that, he more than rose to the occasion. Bob was really in charge that day. He seemed very happy to see everybody, but he decided where each of us would sit, would sit and what was going to happen, in what order. He was making plans for the future, and he ended up in leading us all in singing at the top of our voices every Texas song that Shirley has ever been written. <laughs> He was a fine friend, and he demonstrated how to live life to its fullest and find joy in being alive, no matter what obstacles we face between now and then. No, the bell is enough for me. <laughs> oh, great. Um, now, I'm Louis Cellini, uh, director of the National Weather Service, uh, and a very uh, a dear friend of uh, Bob and Joanne. Um, Joanne being my boss for over a decade. Um, first, I want to thank Lynn and Peggy for inviting me up here um, and um, being able to say a few words uh, in their own. Uh, everything you'll hear today, um, 
clearly attest to Bob's graciousness and determination and vision. We've already heard this for whatever he did. And, uh, and yes, he's one of the few people that, you know, when he sets a vision, he actually accomplishes it uh, more times than not. Um, and reviewing his uh, professional work, it, it became clear to me that he paved the way for the entire weather enterprise. And I'll try to make that point with some of the highlights uh, this morning. Um, and it's also obvious that early on, he knew um, how much this mattered, uh, not only to him as a scientist, but to, the, to this country, to society, to the world. Um, he was a true visionary in that regard as well. And he also realized how exciting it would be. So he, he is a giant. He was a giant in the meteorological community. Um, from the science part to the service part, uh, making that connection. Um, these weren't random walks for the sake of discovery, although obviously he was very excited about that as well. And he was one of the first to transcend the, the, um, the bridge between the public sector and the private sector, which uh, within our science now has become one of the pillars for us moving forward. And when it came to hurricanes, he covered all the bases. Uh, Observation strategy, all forecasts start with observations. Uh, forecast improvement, uh, modification, speak a little bit about that. Uh, and even communicating risks, simply. Um, Bob Wright and I have had lots of discussions about that with respect to winter weather. Uh, Bob sort of cracked the code for hurricanes. So he did it all. Um, so first of all, the observation strategy. He was an early proponent of using the hurricane hunter aircraft to gather data in real time. Now, he wasn't the first. I talked to Rick Nam, the director of the Hurricane Center, who's sitting here, and um, he uh, relayed the history of the Hurricane Hunters. The first one we'll go through was a Navy pilot in 1944, uh, 43? Yeah, 43, uh, and did it on a dare, okay? <laughs> which is great for the military pilots. But uh, Bob saw the value in this. Um, if you could get the data back to the hurricane center in real time, uh, first major hurdle. Um, so for situational awareness, that was the first use of the uh, hurricane hunters, and it turned to be an invaluable data set as we see today. And now it's used in, um, in initializing the numerical models as well, which is a fundamental part of our forecast strategy. So you think about where we were then and where we are today, we're actually testing the uh, global hawks, the uh, pilotless drones to fly in and out of uh, hurricanes. So you can see this arc from Bob's early work to uh, what's going on today. And that data is actually also being used not only in the models that we run in the United States, but run around the world. So um, a really tremendous uh, advantage there. Um, improving forecasts, as you'll hear from Rick Anthony's who follows, uh, Bob was an early proponent of the use of numerical models um, to uh, study and better understand hurricanes and then to predict them in real time. And if you think that was an easy task, besides all the science and technology that's involved in that, he was up against basically a hurricane of resistance from the forecast community. Um, that you know, it took about 30 years before they adopted models in general for day-to-day uh, -day forecasting. But the resistance within the tropical community was really intense, where the challenges to modeling was the, 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 really the highest. And in fact, um, and I know this for a fact, that the National Hurricane Center didn't accept the use of models in their forecast, the day-to-day -day forecast, until after Andrew, because that was the first time that our models were actually able to put the resolution we had and the physics we had, capture the L that represented the hurricane, and be used uh, to uh, make a prediction. Uh, the models actually captured the landfall of Andrew uh, in Miami very accurately three days in advance. And that's what turned the hurricane center around. So that's in the 90s. Bob was promoting this in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Okay. Um, the storm modification, I think, Close to Bob, know that he and Joe Lane were very um, important in organizing and conducting Project Storm Fury, which was the first attempt to modify hurricanes by seeding the inner core and changing the intensity. And everything looked great, I and mean, they had some positive results that they were ready to hang their heads on, but then the lawyers got involved. 
and there's some very interesting stories about that, but basically shut the experiment down as if, if you modify the track of a hurricane from going in this direction to that direction, and there are people living in that direction, this is what they're going to do to you. They're going to sue you. So um, nice experiment, and that's where it stands. Um, communicating risk, uh, there, you know, there were various attempts to develop impact scales or uh, some kind of scale for, uh, for hurricanes, but um, the Sanford, you know, Bob along with her Sanford were the first to link a meteorological parameter to buildings, you know, wind categories to destructive potential. Um, so this meteorological component to something physical uh, is what is it? That's an impact. Okay, and that that impact scale is actually the first one to be developed. Preceded Fujita's uh, attempt to do uh, similar work for the uh, for the tornadoes. So today, um, you talk to the emergency management community. They know the community, the, the people that they're trying to save to get to move, <coughs> understand that scale. Uh, it works both ways. If it's a category one or two, people don't tend to move. If it's a category three, four, or five, they three they start thinking about moving, four they move, five they just get the hell out of there, right? <laughs> so this is a very simple communication strategy that they use, and it's really it, it, it ups the challenge for the forecasters in the hurricane center because intensity is the hardest parameter to forecast. But that's the basis of that scale. And no matter what is done to modify the scale or provide other scales for surge and other things, that win on buildings will, will remain as a, as a basis. So, you know, he, he was uh, not only involved in this incredible spectrum of research operations uh, during his um, uh, active years, he never let go. He was, he was always active, um, as we've heard already. And um, I think the, the wake up moment for me in terms of how active he wanted to remain is when Barbara Schobel arranged for him to Skype into jump the celebration we had at AMS headquarters when we named the atrium after Joe Lance Simpson. He was right there, and I, I still remember very clearly him leaning into the camera. He wanted to lean right through the screen, right into the room. And uh, I know the people behind him were all kind of busy with other things. He was just and, and likewise, uh, two years ago, um, he Skyped, uh, Ben Barber, you organized that, he Skyped into uh, the Hurricane Conference, and he remained engaged on issues on modeling, observations, and we're talking about man, it's 100 years old. So um, thanks, Barbara, for setting that up. Uh, it not only made him happy, it made a lot of the younger people involved in these efforts, um, um, you know, amazed by, by, uh, by him. So um, his accomplishments, now I have to get to his bureaucratic um, abilities, which you could get away with uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Uh, we know you can't get away with some of this stuff today. Um, so he, he became the go-to guy in the Weather Bureau, right, for all his insights and everything he was initiating and how he got things started and then sent the bill to Washington that somehow got paid. Um, so when, um, uh, when the uh, effort of, you know, of organizing Hawaii and the Hawaii Weather Bureau um, activities that came about, Reichelberg actually turned to Bob um, to go out to Hawaii and help organize the whole forecast structure out there. And at first he resisted, um, and Reichelberg um, um, then asked Bob, well, what will it take to get you out there? And Bob laid out his terms. And one of those was his interest in establishing the observatory of Loa. So Michael Lerfer agreed to all of this. You had to go knock yourself out, basically, see what you can do out there with Loa and other things. Um, so Bob accepted and went out there. So once, uh, once he got, now I'm relying here, there's a book that's actually just been published on establishing this observatory, which now provides, for example, the benchmark observations for all this you know, CO2 observations that are now used as a benchmark uh, uh, for this, these global measurements. Um, so he focused on establishing this observatory. Um, he recognized its value. He recognized the value to the scientific community, and he set out to build it. So this wasn't an easy feat either. 
So, you know, how do you get a road up to 13? Well, the summit's 13,000 feet, the observatory is actually at 11,000 feet. How do you get a road built up there? You got the, the parks department, I really don't, don't want anything disturbed, okay? So he realized the first thing he needed was, um, he needed somebody in the local uh, community that he could go and support it. It was, as Peggy noted, this, he formed an unholy alliance, as this author names has indicated, uh, with the director of the prison camp, who had this vision of building a, a ski a ski lodge up there. That never happened. But because he had some local support, he was able to get to the Navy, who loaned him two road readers. That's all he needed. And he had a handshake agreement with, um, with the National Park Service, the director back here in Washington, to build the roads. Just a handshake agreement. So building the roads. And, um, <coughs> And then when the local Park Service uh, staff members found out about it, they, they were very much opposed to it. They never got an audience with the Interior Secretary, Oscar Chapman. Okay, they didn't even get the audience. So the roads got built. So once he got the roads built, building an observatory became an easy task, and, and the project got done. And as I noted today, the Mauna Loa Observatory serves as the global benchmark for the CO2 uh, measurements. So this is pure Bob Simpson. Um, we joked a little bit about uh, in the 90s how life has changed. It wasn't just Bob who told me he didn't think he could, he could last in the government for more than one or two years under those circumstances. Now we have staffers, GS-13 staffers, who sit there with laptops and bring up your budgets and everything. You can't move around these folks. Um, but um, not back then. They were all clueless and you just went off and got things <laughs> So uh, the last thing, with respect to Mauna Loa, he, he never lost his uh, love for the hurricanes. Um, uh, Tom Schroeder, who was uh, a professor at the University of Hawaii and is considered the uh, island weather guru and a, a very close friend of his, um, he's, um, he noted that Bob suggested to the Barrows that being the hurricane research uh, project, that they should make funds available to that observatory. He needed, he needed uh, research money to keep things going up there. And um, the, um, uh, the and this really cracks me up. This he said that we could study the cold core nature of these lows if one of them just happens to pass over the observatory. And I'm not sure that it ever happened, but he did get the money. Um, so um, you know, Bob was not only a, a, a great scientist, a great inside man uh, within the bureaucracy to get things done. As you've already heard, he was a great friend and mentor to many. And um, uh, you know, some people say it was hundreds of uh, meteorologists that he mentored at one stage or another. Um, obviously, it's countless. And even to, in, in that conference that he skyped in, hundreds of people became aware of, of his insights and, and, and rose to that occasion. Um, he also um, mentored me. Um, Little did I know when Joanne Simpson interviewed for her position as our leader at the Severe, um, the Goddard Severe Storm Branch, and then accepted the position, um, she became a supervisor. Me and Bob Adler, who is also here, um, they, I know they, um, Joanne through the Trim Project mentored Bob um, and, and his work. Um, she, they also mentored me. I, I left Goddard. They were very, um, Joanne was very accepting of that going over to the weather service. Um, and she and Bob never really let go. Uh, when I left and uh, got the Space Flight Center to join the weather service, they encouraged me every step. Uh, and they always called when something good happened, uh, relative to my career. Um, so when I got the position as director for the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, they, they called, they invited, uh, invited me on to a celebration. Um, it was great. And when something they didn't like, uh, that supposedly I was doing, they also called. Um, and if we went over to their apartment, um, and I was trying to explain to Joanne the rationale, if you can remember Joanne, she'd close her eyes and shake her head back and forth. You knew you lost her. I turned to Bob, Bob would just sit there and smile and say, you know, point to Joanne. You know, that, was the, that was the reaction. Um, two years ago, uh, when I was selected as the National Weather Service Director, Bob contacted me. Uh, he um, called to congratulate and told me how proud he was and how 
my proud Joe Ann would have been too, and I really appreciated that um, action. So um, I personally, and I know many others, uh, will forever be indebted to Bob for encouraging us and expanding our minds and the universe we operate in today. Uh, that's a legacy I hope we can all carry uh, forward in his honor. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks uh, to the uh, Simpson daughters for inviting me to this um, ceremony. I'm um, very proud to be part of the uh, uh, group of distinguished uh, speakers, and uh, several of them friends of mine for uh, over a generation. December 19, 2014, Bob Simpson joined the great legendary hurricane forecasters of all times. The hurricane priest, Father Benito Venus, Grady Norton and Gordon Dunn. Bob was born on November 19, 1912 in Corpus Christi, Texas, as you've heard. In his 102 years, Bob led a rich and full life, making significant advances in the science of meteorology and forecasting, particularly hurricane forecasting. Bob's long and fascinating story, beginning as a young observer of weather, and the almost apocryphal story of his witnessing as a seven-year-old boy the devastation of the 1919 Corpus Christi hurricane seemed, seemed to ordain that he would devote his life to his professional passion of hurricane research and forecasting. In my brief remarks, it would be really impossible to cover Bob's uh, professional and personal journey through the 20th century and beyond. Uh, extensive records and interviews by uh, Ed Zipser, Dave Atlas, and soon to come uh, Neil Dorst, as has been mentioned, uh, will provide, uh, do provide an excellent historical account of this uh, really remarkable amazing. So instead, I will try to honor him and his wife Joanne with some brief personal remarks about my close interactions with them as a graduate student during the halcyon days of the 1960s in Miami. During much of this decade, the 1960s, Bob was director of the National Hurricane Center, and Joanne, who Bob married in 1965, was the director of NOAA's Experimental Meteorological Laboratory. I was working as a uh, student trainee uh, during the summers at the National Hurricane Research Laboratory, uh, which was uh, uh, started by Bob as the National Hurricane Research Project 10 years earlier in 1954. So EML, the Experimental Meteorological Laboratory, NHRL, the National Hurricane Research Laboratory, and the National Hurricane Center were all in the same building on the University of Miami campus in Coral Gables. The National Hurricane Center was on the top floor, the fifth floor, where they could see the hurricanes coming in. <laughs> NHRL uh, research lab was on the fourth floor, and experimental meteorological lab was on the third floor. These vertical separations did not hinder the frequent interactions between, uh, and sometimes arguments, I must add, involving these three groups. Legendary researchers like, like Bill Gray, who unfortunately cannot be here today, Gray Holland, Others would visit uh, Miami uh, during the uh, summer and other times. Seminars on the fourth floor were uh, frequent and usually marked by Bob and Joanne sitting in the front row holding hands while paying rapt attention to the speakers. These were the days of big ideas. Three-dimensional hurricane models, prediction models, the first satellite views of hurricanes, Project Storm Theory, which has been mentioned already, a research program first directed by Bob in 1962 and later by Joanne that attempted to determine whether hurricanes could be modified by seeding supercooled water with silver iodide. There were frequent and lively debates about whether cloud seeding could produce significant changes in hurricanes. 
and whether supercooled water even existed in sufficient amounts to make a difference. There are arguments about whether numerical models would ever be better or even useful to human forecasters, as has already been alluded to by, by Louis. Whether satellite data would ever be worth their cost. How hot towers do drove hurricane circulations. Or the relative roles of radiation and latent heating uh, in the formation and maintenance of hurricanes. Then after working hours uh, and, uh, and on weekends, there were uh, after working hours and on weekends, there were softball games, picnics, and occasionally sailing on uh, Sunday afternoon off Key Biscayne and Bob's boat. And Bob is the ultimate captain of a sailboat, as you can uh, imagine. Simpsons were larger than life, and so beloved and respected, ironically, they were made fun of in their presence even. And slightly irreverent Christmas skits by immature scientists like myself, <laughs> Bill Woodley, Pete Black, Joe Golden, Russ D'Souza, Bill Cotton, and Roger Pilkey. We were in our late teens and early 20s at that time, and we were immature, and we poked fun at Bob and Joanne. Uh, and they loved it. They really loved it. Such halcyon days never last long, but they're remembered forever. When I went to uh, Penn State at the end of that decade in 1971, Pop Simpson uh, gave me my first research grant as an assistant professor at Penn State, an $1,800, $1,800 grant from the National Hurricane Center to study data assimilation in hurricane models. Has been mentioned already, the, the culture against models in the hurricane community was huge. And nobody knew what data simulation was, and there were no hurricane models. So, but Bob patted me on the back and said, you know, go, go forth and do good things. I can't close my remarks without commenting on the relationship between Bob and Joanne, which I think is one of the greatest love stories in meteorology, perhaps one of the greatest love stories of, of all times. Two very, very different scientists fell in love and stayed in love for more than 40 years until Joanne died in 2010. And nobody described this relationship better than Bob himself in Ed Zitzer's 1989 interview, and I will read from uh, Bob's quote. My association with Joanne Moffis, who later became Joanne Simpson, has meant more to me, both professionally and personally, than any other factor in my life. And I would like to think that perhaps it was a reciprocal benefit for us both. There were many things that Joanne did real well that I couldn't touch. And I believe some things that were easy for me and more difficult for her, I was able to help with. In any event, our lives, both professionally and personally, and to some extent our respective achievements, have been uniquely buoyed by our decision to meld our two careers through marriage. Bob Simpson's passing marks the end of an era of hurricane research and forecasting that saw the evolution of this field from an art carried out by careful observers of the weather who synthesized limited observations in somewhat mysterious ways that not even they understood to a quantitative science based on abundant data and accurate models to produce forecasts and warnings to one of nature's most dangerous storms. Although this era has come to a close with his death, the remarkable story of Bob and his wife Joanne will remain forever in their legacy of supporting young scientists in research and forecasting of tropical weather will continue through their generous endowment with the Bob and Joanne Simpson Memorial Fellowship, a postdoctoral fellowship for young scientists interested in tropical meteorology at the world famous advanced uh, study program at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in CAR. Thank you.
Simpson family, friends. I want to talk to you a little bit about this cap. It's a journeyman's cap, handcrafted, it says, from pure new wool. Thank goodness, I would hate to have it old, greasy wool. <laughs> Furthermore, it says it was manufactured in Donegal Town, Ireland. We all like the Irish. Perhaps you like them a while, even better. Far from the far from being a hat that you would find on Pennsylvania Avenue or in the White House, Bob wore this hat uh, for things which he achieved and you heard about uh, in this in this book this morning. It is Bob's cap symptomatic of his hands-on work uh, that he did throughout his career, from Swan Island, again as you've heard, to Hawaii, and even flying through at 20,000 feet into the eye wall of a hurricane. Bob was a hands-on meteorologist who applied his knowledge to things that mattered to other people. He he brought his philosophy to Simpson Weather Associates such that the application is there and formed the backbone of what that firm has done over the space of 40 years. This is not to say that the theoretical work that he was also interested in did not carry the same status, but it does say that to have the courage to propose the idea that one could modify a hurricane stands with head and shoulders above almost all other work. Having, having the courage to tackle this possibly brings him to, to a stage where I would want to say that Bob did a great honor to the people that he, he worked for. And he did me a distinguished honor bequeathing me this cap. Pause to think for a moment what this cap might mean. It's surely a very personal gift. At no time when you wore it, or when you wear it, could you not think of Bob and think of all the good things that he did. Bob was a tough but gentle man. He touched the lives of many people and many people will wear this cap and benefit from his, his achievements. He will remain in our memory for a long time. Thank you. a young lad around the great tax state of Texas did roam. Hurricanes and college were taken in stride. A horn blower of some note he became. These were Bob's formative years and he often spoke to me about them uh, both uh, when I first met him but also in later life. And you look back on them as the years that actually gave him the tools and the incentive and the ability to actually carry through and do what he, what he, um, he, he subsequently did, of which he'd heard a lot. It also, I think, sharpened those abilities. I'm sure that Bob was born with many of those. And in particular, his great vision. He had a, he had a sort of vision that was outstanding. He could actually see things in the future, as we've heard, that you'd look at him and you'd say, well, how the hell did you see that? And then he'd look back at you and, uh, and you'd say, well, do you believe it? And I said, I, I believe it, yes. Uh, how did you see it? And of course, he would never answer that question. I was privileged to know Bob, as others have said, uh, in many, many capacities. But I'd like to talk a little bit about Bob, the father, Bob the husband,
husband, sailor, and mentor. To watch his interactions with daughters Peg and Lynn was to see a great bond of love, protection, and support that carried him through to his passing. And I know that he would want me to say that he very much appreciated everything they did in that time. I know they would want me to say that they had a hell of a good time doing it as well. And of course, there is another person involved here, because along the way, a lady of metal did Bob meet. Bob and Joanne, together, were as one. They really were. When they walked down the street, it was like a single entity was walking down the street. When they actually met, it was like a single entity was there. But you can't much further than that. Because this oneness enabled them as individuals to shine. Yes, they were one, but you never ever lost sight of the fact that Bob was his person and Joanne was his person, her person. I must say that they were very different in the way they mentored people as well. When Joanne was upset with me, I knew Joanne was upset with me. When Bob was upset with me, I don't think he ever actually got upset with me, he never actually showed that, but you would just simply have a quiet chat and you're left in no doubt that, you know, perhaps that was something that you shouldn't have done. And, you know, because of that quietness and because of the way he said that, it was much more powerful. And I actually learned to really, really look to Bob as both a mentor and very much a father figure. So let me recount you a little story. I could name many scientists that have actually stood up to go and give a talk. And as they go to the lectern, they're sitting in the front row in front of them as Bob and Joanne beaming away. And you start. And then suddenly Bob would lean forward and Joanne would sit there and shake her head. <laughs> and all you could think for the rest of that talk was, bloody hell. <laughs> Up goes a hand. The dreaded question. This is amongst the most innovative and exciting work I have ever seen. And you sort of look at them. And as many of us found out at a very young age, when Bob and Joanne were very agitated and jumping up and down, they loved everything you were doing. If they sat there serene and quiet and giving you this sort of pitying look, then you were in trouble. We've heard stories of Bob love for sailing, and I was privileged to go on many sailing trips in many parts of the world with both of them. We actually contrived at one point, actually Joanne contrived, and I was a willing participant. In those days, the Australian government wouldn't let me take leave when I went overseas. So Joanne said, but you must come on this trip that we're going to make down the Chesapeake. And I said, well, Joanne, I can't really make it. That's all right, we'll call it an air sea interaction experiment. <laughs> and we did, and we devoted considerable effort and time to interacting with the sea and the air. join Joanne. And I bet even now, they're not, looking, they're not watching this, they're actually off sailing Sabrina to some unknown land. And I guarantee it will be sailed extremely well. So now it's time for us to say goodbye. But has he really gone? Bob lives on, he really does, in the structures that he set up, in the legacies he's left, and the young people, and not so young people nowadays, that he has actually been to. So it really is time to say goodbye to the physical presence and say hello to his enduring legacy. Thank you. Friends, as I'm sat here, I'm 
feel like our space a little bit has been transformed into a wonderful laboratory where we have been enlightened about box scientific research, experiments of sailing, mentoring, enduring love with Joanne, supporting friend and a loving dad. Thank you all friends for sharing your stories and your witness. What a gift it is for all of us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for all that you have blessed us with even until this day. For the gift of joy in days of health and strength, and for the gift of your abiding presence and promise in days of grief and pain. We thank you for the full and rich life of Robert Homer Simpson, who has finished his course in faith and now rest from his labor. In celebration of his earthly life of 102 years, may we know of your grace and mercy, and in celebration of his eternal life with you, may we know of the everlasting love that is to come for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Mm -hmm. 